In this debate, Dr. Bowen and Dr. Maggie Bryson go up against Jonathan Sheffield and the synagogue, and they're discussing whether or not the Exodus is myth or history. Dr. Bowen offers his opinion here. Now, he is an Assyriologist, and so we're going to listen to what an Assyriologist has to say about Egypt, and then we'll listen to what an Egyptologist has to say about Egypt. And that was when we bring in Dr. David Falk to respond to Dr. Bo Josh Bowen's assertions. About um, distinguishing between what verisimilitude in the story suggests, and I'm really sorry, that's my three-year-old, um, and how far we can how far we can push that into the story. And what I mean by that is like, you know, Dr. Bryson can speak to this. Uh, you, you, you know, we have um, Anastasia Papyri that from the New Kingdom, right? That, that talk about uh, whether they're school texts and how much, you know, that, that pulls from their validity or, uh, you know, uh, uh, speaks to their validity or not from a, I think it, it probably, if it's anything like what we see in, in a Sumerian text, that it, it probably does reflect some sort of, maybe some sort of practice. Uh, but at any rate, if you have something like, you know, Papyrus Anastasi, what, five or six, I always mix them up, uh, where it talks about two slaves, that probably Canaanite slaves, um, are escaping from Egypt. And on their way out, they're taking a path that's very similar seems on its face to maybe what the Israelites did and they're being chased and they're being tracked and there's border crossing and like for two, right? Uh, that sort of thing is, it's like, it's, it's evidence that we want to use to say this gives some verisimilitude that slaves did escape. It would seem, it seems very likely that they did, but then we also have to factor in that there's only two of them and they're being pretty pretty clearly tracked, right? Because following the Hyksos, uh, and again, Egyptian history is not my thing, uh, but it seems like there's a lot of, you know, um, uh, control on the border. Let's note that he is making an assumption about the particular path that these two slaves took, and that it's the same particular path of the Egyptians. Dr. Falk will address. And so, you know, those are the things that I have to I think we have to factor in if we're thinking about this and I'll stop, but if we, you know, if we're thinking about this from like a criminal investigation standpoint, which, you know, I think is one way to come at this, we want to think in terms of like means, motive and opportunity. So when I think about things like the Exodus, if we have two of the three, but they don't have an opportunity or we, you know, they're supposed to be at Kadesh Barnea for 38 years, and there's no, there's nothing, maybe some 12th century shirts, maybe, but there's nothing there, no, no architecture at all before what the 10th century. It's like, okay, so that was what he posited, and we're going to see how Dr. Falk responds. He was talking about this papyrus that talked about these two slaves. And he said, because the, Europe, the Egyptians had all these fortifications, that it's unlikely that the, this large group of Israelites would be able to escape given all of these fortifications. And that seems to maybe relate to your last answer to the last question. Mm -hmm. Well, it does definitely. Because uh, one of the, the route that the uh, Israelites take is actually not fortif well fortified. It's not well fortified. There was a Ketem fortress, which is a, a sort of a, a entry checkpoint. It's a major fortress, but that's at Pithom. That's at Pithom. So once they get past there, they're, they're not going out the northern route. Because because when the Israelites leave Egypt, um, they're actually on the south bank of the Plusiac. Hmm. They're not crossing the river to take a direct northern route. They could have. They could have taken uh, crossed the river and taken a road north through, say, the fortress Charu, and then the Lion's Den, and then Migdol. Okay, they could have taken that route, but that would have been possibly a fight all the way through. But they're already on the southern bank, so it doesn't actually make sense for them to cross the river. They go south and cross through the Wadi Tumalot, where there's only one fortress. There's only one fortress there, and that's at the uh, prov provincial capital of, of Pithom or Peratum, the, the house of Atum. Hmm. Once they cross that, there's no more fortresses unless they decide to go back up to the northern route. What you do have there, though, you do have some looking posts. You do have some outposts there. 
there are a bunch of little towns out there on the, on the basically the, the southern um, side of the Pelusiac estuary. So you'll like Pihahi wrote is probably a, 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 a looking post, an observation post. But it is not, say, a fully garrisoned uh, Ketem fortress. So as long as they avoided that, that northern road, there's no, no fortresses to hunt them down. Yeah, so geographically good. consistent. Hmm. Yeah, that's and fascinating. In the, in the papyrus, uh, in the Anastasi papyri, and it's many, those are many papyri. It's not just one. There's many of those papyri. We find the names of these G, uh, of this geography that we find in the biblical texts. Balsafon is mentioned. Pihahirod is mentioned. Migdol is mentioned. Pithom is mentioned. Paramzis mm -hmm. is mentioned. You know, these are all, you know, even the Yam Suf, the Sea of Reeds, is mentioned. All of these are real, actual place names that we find in both the biblical and the Egyptian records. Yeah. Good to know. Good to know. So I hope you enjoyed this. Please like, subscribe, and do come again. And just remember, whether you eat, drink, or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Thank you.